Welcome back to the Morning Brew, everyone. Over the last week, and I'm, I'm gonna even stretch this out to a few weeks, you've been hearing a lot about the economic impact, and we've been talking a lot here on the Morning Brew, and by extension, the station, about the economic impact the novel coronavirus is having, not just on your personal pockets, but also on businesses across the country. And it's a really important topic of discussion that not only we had we had to talk about, but we have to continue talking about, because at the end of the day, these businesses that are shut uh, hire a lot of people, scores, if not dozens, hundreds of people, depend on businesses every day to get a salary, monthly or fortnightly. And because many businesses are closed, uh, non-essential businesses are closed across the country, many people are out of jobs, many people are not making salaries. So it's an important topic of conversation that we continue talking about and how we'll be able to help people and how we'll be able to help the business community. A man that will be able to give us some more insight will be Gregory Abood, who's a DOMA president, uh, the Downtown Owners and Merchants Association president. Mr. Abood, good morning to you. Thanks a lot for joining us. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, businesses across the city, or at least many of them, are shot. It's certainly not a sight uh, that we like seeing. Right. Well, I mean, this is a requirement of the circumstances. This is not a question of preference. This is a question of responsibility. Looking at this, uh, you know, the impact of it on especially uh, downtown, uh, what do you think and w what impact have you seen over the, over the first week, I should say, uh, since the, the total lockdown has taken place? Well, to be honest, um, Ryan, I actually feel that there has been too much emphasis placed on the effect that this current state of affairs is having on business. And by that I mean, apart from the legitimate concern for the welfare of those that depend on businesses for their income, for their weekly, fortnightly, or monthly income, I personally feel that there has been too much emphasis placed on this question of the effect on business. What we have to do in my respectful view is to keep a closer eye on the main issue of the day, which is the health and the safety of the citizens of the country, the health and safety of the business people and of their staff. This is a primary concern and, uh, you know, it is like a cancer patient wondering what he or she is going to go to the movies to see or something of this sort. These issues about the well-being of business and the effect of, on business are secondary to the major crisis <clears throat> which we are facing, which is how to guarantee that we can escape from a massive crisis in, in cases, in infections, and in deaths. This is our major function at the moment. And I personally feel that all of this focus on economics and on the effect of the shutdown on business and so on is somewhat misplaced and what we have to do is to focus on the maintenance of some sort of subsistence for the tens of thousands of people who are not working and we have to focus after that on guaranteeing that we have the fewest number of infections and the fewest number of deaths and that we break this transmission and get back to being part of what we know to be our day-to-day -day life in Trinidad and Tobago. That, subsist that subsistence that you talk about, do you then agree with the government's move? The, do you think the grants that the government, are, the, the grants the government is working on is a step in the right direction? Well, let me say this. Um, the, the, the general consensus among many of the world economists at this time is that COVID-19 is not going to destroy the economies of the world. It is going to put the economies of the world into a state of comatose, um, you know, a, a comatose state, let me say. The world's economies are, uh, are in a state of coma at the moment. They have not been destroyed, but they are dormant and non-operative. And the principal function of governments at the moment 
is to guarantee that there is life support for the patient while the patient is in a, in a coma state. And life support means in the United States, for instance, um, unemployment insurance and the support of the citizen. In Trinidad and Tobago, life support for the economy, in my respectful opinion, means that the business community, the employer class of the country, has to do its duty to make sure that it does not disconnect those persons who depend on the business community for, for, for salaries and, and, and wages. It must not allow them to become disconnected. They must be supported. They must be given some sort of subsistence and stipend. A percentage of their weekly or monthly salary must be given so that we do not allow anybody to fall overboard or anybody to go from a state of coma into a state of, 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 of loss. And in that regard, when this is over, if we give good life support, and if when we come back, the, the, the government provides the type of stimulus that business people and investors respond to, I think the patient, the economy will wake up. And history has shown recently in the case of the attempted coup in Trinidad and Tobago and going back to the events that followed the Second World War, history has shown that with the proper stimulus, reconstruction, rebuilding, and expansion of the economy can occur in, 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 in situations that follow crisis and so on. My major concern, and I feel I, I'm obligated to echo the sentiments of the government ministers and the prime minister who are leading us through this stormy patch that our principal concern has to be to take very seriously the threat of this, inf this infection and the threat of loss of life and, and tragedy among our citizens. An international economist made the point, and I feel like you're on the same page with him, if not similar, is that uh, these jobs, the, the jobs that are being lost, not just here in Trinidad and Tobago and by extension the Caribbean, but all around the world, uh, like you said, the economy is in a comatose state. Uh, those jobs will come back uh, post-pandemic. Do you share that view? I do share the view that the world... The world wants to live, the world wants to turn, the world wants to operate that life goes on, that after every great tragedy, there is usually a, 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 a blossoming of people's spirits and of their faith in the future, and that nothing has stopped mankind yet. Of course, this particular threat represents a real, um, a real footnote in history of, of, of a pandemic that could stop mankind. Uh, this is a this is a an, an epic moment in world history, global in nature. This is obviously a very serious threat to civilization, and if we get past it, which it which, which it seems that we can, given the given the history of particularly of North, of of Korea and of China, if we get past it, there is no reason to feel that that the human race is not going to want to live again. Absolutely, in fact, the evidence suggests that humanity wants to live and that after events such as these, which deprive us of movement and which deprive us of freedom, that we do um, burst back onto the scene with exuberance within an attempt to recover our lives. It will take some time for people to feel safe enough to, to get on a plane or a cruise ship again and indeed our countries and the islands of the Caribbean will be a little nervous about allowing anyone to want to fly into our country or to want to travel to our country on a cruise ship. It is going to take time, but it will come back, in my opinion, and history has proven that it should come back. And we have the recent evidence of our recovery after the attempted coup of 1990 and the policies of the Robinson regime in the time immediately after the event and of the Manning administration in 1991 after the, um, the event of the attempted coup to prove that the correct policies can stimulate investment, can create jobs and can uh, help us to recover. 
As Doma president, do you have any adding to the grants and, and the other subsistences that government has been working on? Um, do you have any suggestions or any uh, advice uh, for government on, on any other directions that they should go to help the economy, to help people who are in need at this particular time and who have been laid off or who have been uh, fired altogether? Well, I appreciate the question because, you know, we have had, in my opinion, um, a good state of collaboration between all sectors of the society and the government. We have had or have seen the need to be together and to join hands in common efforts to try and create safe conditions for citizens in this time of pandemic threat. I am hoping that we will have similar collaboration and that we will continue to keep our hands joined on the stimulus needed to activate economic expansion post COVID-19. And some of, the, some of the factors which play into that include that the private sector and private citizens are sitting on hundreds of billions of TT dollars in the banks, which has not been invested, which has not been used uh, for new projects or expansionary projects because of their concerns or their uncertainty about the future. I firmly believe that that is where the expansionary capital has to come from. Once we get past COVID-19, once we cooperate with the authorities and stay at home, once we understand the seriousness of this threat and we get out of it, I feel that the government should employ the type of tactics which were employed elsewhere in a Marshall Plan that, it, that, that uh, the Americans brought after World War II in the economic stimulus packages which were given by the ANR Robertson regime, which include interest subsidies on loans, by the Manning administration's uh, policies in its 1991 budget, which included uh, the grant of tax-free status or tax-free exemption for income on rent on construction that produced residential and commercial space. Those sorts of incentives, and those are not the only incentives that can be offered, but that type of incentivization is what government must do. Government cannot, it does not have the money to do it itself. It must incentivize the investment community it must show its appreciation for where the expansion of the economy can come from, and it must lead the way by providing those sorts of stimuli to the economy so that we could get Trinidad and Tobago to work again once this threat is over. But we must, I would like to emphasize, and I appreciate your patience and tolerance in allowing me to repeat myself so often, we must stay at home. We must break the back of the transmission of this virus we must behave ourselves so that we do not have massive expansion and fatality. And, and once we get past that, with the right stimuli, I think Trinidad and Tobago has a great shot at coming back to, to full you know, economic um, prosperity. Mr. Abood, I know that you've been using history uh, as a reference to how we can get over this present crisis that we're facing. Um, just over a week ago, uh, legislation was passed uh, to change the rules, the fiscal rules of the uh, Heritage and Stabilization Fund so we can use money, uh, a billion and a half dollars, out of that HSF. Uh, is that a move that you supported? Well, I think, I mean, there is debate on this subject at the moment. And, I, you know, the critical litmus test will be how that money is used and spent. This is obviously the money that belongs to future generations of our citizens and we are spending our children's and grandchildren's money and we have to be very cognizant of that. Uh, I, I certainly think that the conditions exist to allow the government to make use. I think that the fund itself envisages this sort of crisis to allow access to the fund. I feel that the details of how that money is being spent are obviously an entitlement to the population. They must know um, how that money is spent. And I also would like to say that apart from appreciating that this is a classic case of us needing a fund such as this one, I 
believe in my own heart that this is the wrong time to be bickering about the actions that the government is taking. I feel in my own mind that we are in stormy conditions. We are in a patch of very bad weather, and the ship of state happens to have one group at the bridge now driving that ship, guiding it. And our job at this time is not to rattle them and to pick up and to complain. Our job is to wish them well and to pray for their success because they have the same objective that we do, which is to get through this storm and to come out into calm water again and then to assess the damage done to the vessel, to the ship of state, and hopefully all together to put it back together and to repair it and to sail on into the future. That, I believe, is a message I would like to send to all the economists and all the commentators and all those who have so many complaints about everything that the government is doing. This is not the time to be bickering and to be rattling the calm or the, the composure of those who are on the bridge in this storm. I believe that the government has done a more than reasonable job. Our health um, people have done a good job and we should be proud of the fact that we are being guided on a regular basis, on a daily basis. We have been given all of the facts and that everything has been done to put Trinidad and Tobago ahead of many other countries who are in much greater peril than we are. And on the question of stabilization and heritage fund, it is a good um, textbook case for making use of the fund, and it is not a good time to be bickering and griping and, and rattling those who are on the bridge guiding the ship of state. Mr. Abood, in our fight uh, in this country to protect our country from the further spread of the novel coronavirus, we've sometimes been our worst enemy in this. I mean, for the few essential services and businesses that have been open, not just across the city, but across the country, we've seen uh, huge crowds gathering in front of banking and financial institutions. Uh, the business community as well has a responsibility in this fight. 100%. Those that are opened, anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely, Ryan. I mean, this is, this is their responsibility. First of all, they have a privilege to earn income in a time of zero income for 90% of the businesses in the country. True. Second of all, they have a, a, a responsibility to their clients and to the citizens of the country to join in the effort to try and prevent the spread. And it is an act of gross um, failure in, in responsibility and in duty of care to see, I mean, that we have been denied the opportunity to do almost everything that we do on a normal day, but yet um, some others are bunched up six inches apart and one foot apart in crowds, in lines, and so on. This is, this is absolutely ridiculous. And you may or may not know, I'm sure you do, that Barbados has gone into a 24-hour yep. lockdown from this morning, and their citizens have been prohibited from movement. Only gas stations are open, and one of the reasons why that has been done is because the citizens did not take seriously the freedom which was given to them to go to the grocery and to go to the uh, market and so on. And the government had no choice because of the growth rate among cases in Barbados to impose this new restrictive regime on them in Barbados. And that very same crisis could, e could eventually come to us if we are not serious enough about keeping distance between ourselves. And may I also add, uh, thank you for allowing me to add, that the latest um, protocols being suggested by the Centers for Disease Control in the United States is that all citizens need to wear a mask. This includes those who are not showing any symptoms at all. This includes persons who are not in contact with anyone who may or may not have had symptoms. This includes every single citizen of the country should wear some sort of facial barrier. And the advice has been given that if you do not have an N95 mask or facial mask, that you can use a scarf or some other garment to cover your face to protect you and in combination 
with social distancing and hand hygiene and so on, the wearing of a face mask is a superior um, method of preventing transmission when combined with distancing and washing of hands. Mr. Gregory Abood, thank you very much for your time. Please stay safe. Thank you very much, Ryan, and God bless our nation. Thank you very much, Mr. Gregory Abood, the DOMA president, Downtown Owners and Merchants Association, talking to us on the morning brew. And he didn't want to just talk about the business impact of this novel coronavirus, but he also says that businesses have a responsibility and failure to do so is a gross failure on their part to have people lining up in front of their businesses in scores, in hundreds to enter their businesses. He also says this is not a time to bicker about uh, the government dipping into the heritage and stabilization fund. Instead, it is a time to work alongside the government. Gregory Abu Doma, president, talking to us on The Morning Brew this morning. Stick around when we come back. We have a lot more for you.